Hi everybody, it's Whitney from All The Shelves. Today I want to talk a little bit about current events and get a little political for this channel. I don't often sort of bring up political controversies, but with all of the events that have been going on this past month, it seems kind of irresponsible to ignore them. I am not usually a big participant in social media activism. I don't have that big of a following, or at least I haven't in the past. Um, I just, you know, have my friends on Facebook and then like a handful of people on Twitter that I can talk to. Um, and it kind of seemed like uh, a way to alleviate some kind of white guilt when I would say something about Black Lives Matter, you know, as a way to just sort of like throw, you know, my opinion into a sea of opinions that are way more informed and important than mine was, um, just as a way to say, like, see, I did my part. Instead, I really try to make a difference in the classroom. About half of my semester in my composition courses was about um, race in America and looking at it through the lens of rhetoric, which I felt like, um, you know, was maybe doing a little bit to at least try to educate some people <laughs> on these issues. But now that I have kind of a bigger YouTube following, I feel a little bit more responsibility to actually say something. And since I'm a part of this booktube community, I feel like we can say things through talking about books, which to us is the way to educate, the way to be an informed citizen and to participate in a democracy is to read books and talk about them. And so I'm going to try and do that a little bit here. So I I think one of the best places to start when we're talking about racialized violence, particularly the violence that can happen between police and the citizens that they are sworn to protect, is to start with Martin Luther King. Um, obviously we can go back much further than that to a lot of prominent black writers and thinkers and speakers who were discussing these issues in American politics. I'm thinking about Frederick Douglass or W.E.B. Du Bois or other big thinkers that have really influenced the ways that we see race in America. But I think particularly with this issue of police officers and people in authority harboring some inherent racist beliefs and whether those are unconscious or con conscious or whether they're implicit or explicit, those beliefs exist in everybody. Um, I don't care who you are, you tend to categorize by race. We have all been socially conditioned at this point to see the world in those ways. We see things in terms of race. And so to pretend that there are a certain group of people that don't have a racial bias and that that racial bias wouldn't present itself when you are in positions of authority is extremely naive and really potentially dangerous. Um, I like the Trevor Noah response to the current shootings when he said that there are police forces like the one in Las Vegas that have taken the extra steps to try to train their officers to recognize those racial biases um, and that that has substantially cut down on violence. So I think a good place to start with this issue is with Martin Luther King Jr. because he is uh, addressing the violence that occurs between people in authority and protesters, specifically in the letter from Birmingham jail. And all of the rhetoric that has surrounded, um, I want to say the opposition, but it's very strange to me that this is um, such a dichotomous issue. Um, it doesn't seem like it should be that way, but it seems like you're either pro-police or pro-black or whatever. I think Trevor Noah talked about that in his video. Um, and that's absurd. You can be pro both, but it does seem like the people who are kind of like on the side of the police seem to be saying there should be um, a more invisible way of fighting this issue. There should be, you know, you should wait for it to go through legislation. Um, the NRA's response, for example, to the shootings has been, well, we're going to take a step back and we're going to see, you know, how it plays out in the courts, despite the fact that there have been numerous shootings that the courts have ruled on, frankly, I believe unjustly. Um, instead, we're going to kind of like wait for that process to unfold. And that reminds me so much of the clergyman who prompted Martin Luther King to write the letter from Birmingham jail. So I have the excerpt here. They said, just as we formally pointed out that hatred and violence have no sanction in our religious and political traditions, we also point out that such actions as incite to hatred and violence, however technically peaceful those actions may be, have not contributed to the resolution of our local problems. We do not believe that these days of new hope are days when extreme measures are justified in Birmingham. We commend the community as a whole and the local news media and law enforcement officials 
in particular, on the calm manner in which these demonstrations have been handled. We urge the public to continue to show restraint should the demonstrations continue and the law enforcement officials to remain calm and continue to protect our city from violence. From our position in 2016, when we look back on photo evidence and video evidence from Birmingham, we see that the police are not acting calmly. Um, we see dogs and fire hoses and, you know, breaking up demonstrations with batons and it's, it's horrifying to look at. And I think that the parallels are there between 1963 Birmingham and 2016. Now I am not saying by any means that racial relations or the way that we conceive of race has not improved over those years. Obviously the things that Martin Luther King Jr. Um, and others like him did in the 19 1960s to ensure that people um, had fair housing and equal rights, etc., those were very valuable. And if you are interested in maybe what the value of the civil rights movement was, you might want to read Alice Walker's 1968 essay, The Civil Rights Movement, What Good Was It? Because she explains the social value of a civil rights movement. But that also doesn't mean that things are on just this like straight line progressing. Um, there are obviously dips in a line of progression, and I don't think that um, assuming that history is only getting better and that things will naturally just become more just is, is absurd. And I think one, evidence, one piece of evidence in favor of that is thinking about how um, race was being reformed in the Reconstruction period. You had black people serving on um, prominent committees and in prominent places in government, and then you look at what happened in the 1920s with the resurgence of the Ku Klux Klan, and the 1920s is the decade in history with the most lynchings. So, you know, obviously things kind of go up and down in a line of progress. And these clergymen are arguing that if you just sit back and wait, things will get better because our country is so great or whatever that naturally it's just going to right wrongs. Well, Martin Luther King Jr. obviously didn't believe that since he is the one that is actively trying to right wrongs and he responded to the clergyman in the letter from Birmingham jail. One of the most powerful moments in his letter is when he addresses this issue of timeliness. He says, we know through painful experience experience that freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. Frankly, I have never yet engaged in a direct action movement that was well-timed, according to the timetable of those who have not suffered unduly from the disease of segregation. For years now I have heard the word wait. It rings in the ear of every Negro with a piercing familiarity. This wait has almost always meant never. It has been a tranquilizing thalidomide, relieving the emotional stress for a moment, only to give birth to an ill-formed infant of frustration. We must come to see with the distinguished jurist of yesterday that justice too long delayed is justice denied. We have waited for more than 340 years for our God-given and constitutional rights. Um, and he goes on, this paragraph is very famous, this is when he lists all of the injustices that he has seen his community experience, including his own immediate family. And rhetorically, I think this moment is perfect. It addresses Kairos, it addresses the clergymen directly, but with a larger audience in mind, and it does so with very powerful metaphors and language. And I think that we could take those sentences and just add some years onto that last part and apply them to what I think African American communities are experiencing today. That people are telling that community, well, you know, you have a black president now, what more do you want? You know, racism must be over because now there is one, you know, prominent black person in power. Um, which, like, of course that is a step in the right direction, but there is also this insane amount of police violence directed at black communities that we can't just sit idly by and watch. We have to make videos about this kind of stuff. We need to talk about it. Um, we need to talk about it in white communities. Always there is a lot of guilt and a lot of trepidation associated with speaking about racial issues as a white person. Um, and I feel that. I especially feel that in the classroom where I teach at a prominently white university. So it's really strange to talk about the civil rights movement and moving that into talking about um, Michelle Obama's fantastic graduation speech last year um, or Barack Obama's A More Perfect Union speech in 2008 when you are in a classroom full of people who have never experienced this kind of racial oppression, full of privileged people who are just starting to come to terms with their own privilege. And I really want to give that young generation like a shout out. I want to give them credit for how quickly they 
um, jump into grappling with these issues and trying to figure things out. And I'm not talking about idiots who are adamantly voting for Trump because of his racist agenda. I'm not talking about people who are starting Facebook fights. I'm talking about like your family members who maybe aren't on Facebook expressing their opinions because they don't quite know what their opinions are. Those are the people to talk to, I think, and those are the people to direct to Martin Luther King's letter because I think that most of us have read that letter in high school or college or we've read it multiple times, but it's always a good idea to return to it. It's an amazing piece of rhetoric in American history. It gives you hope and it also scares you a little bit in a way that I think is very useful. I also think another really persuasive piece of rhetoric from 1963 is James Baldwin's A Talk to Teachers um, and I want to read a passage from it just so you can see how prescient it is. It says, it is inconceivable that a sovereign people should continue as we do so abjectly to say, I can't do anything about it, it's the government. The government is the creation of the people, is responsible to the people, and the people are responsible for it. No American has the right to allow the present government to say, when Negro children are being bombed and hosed and shot and beaten all over the Deep South, that there is nothing we can do about it. There must have been a day in this country's life when the bombing of the children in Sunday school would have created a public uproar and endangered the life of a governor, George Wallace. It happened here, and there was no public uproar. People um, are, I think, expressing a lot of cynicism and pessimism and depression over these events. And while I completely understand that kind of reaction, it doesn't seem especially helpful when you are the one who votes, you're the one who has conversations with the people around you, and you are also the one who chooses every day how to address these issues. It doesn't help to be cynical about it. When the philosopher Zizek talks about ideology, he talks about how ideology has built into it the cynical response. It has cynicism built into it because if a cynical response could take down an ideology, then no ideology could possibly stand. So part of what builds up a hegemony and racism within that hegemony is people feeling like they can't make a difference. And by saying they aren't making a difference, they feel that they are like not buying into the system, but that is exactly buying into the system. Not voting because you feel there's no difference between Republicans and Democrats is buying into the system. That is exactly what the system wants you to do. They want you to believe that you cannot make a difference. So when I see people posting on Facebook um, and getting angry about the things that we've been experiencing this month, it gives me a little bit of hope um, as obnoxious as Facebook can be and I really, social media can be the very worst and I think that the internet can really bring out the worst in people. It's true that this violence has been happening and the only thing that's different now seems to be the presence of cameras, the accountability that people are forced to confront. Um, and I'm not saying that that accountability is in the court system. I'm saying that that count accountability is expressing itself as public opinion, which I feel is a real hopeful step in the right direction. So I hope that we keep talking about this stuff. I hope that we continue reading this stuff. And I hope that everybody is being safe out there. And I will see you in my next video.